So then we want the space curve, and then we're going to want the space time curve. Let's answer the third question. It's Earth curve. So how can we measure if the Earth is curved or not? Imagine we have a big rope, so we kind of really go away and you know go around the Earth. So if we have a roof of two meters all around the world, and the world would be you know perfectly spherical, but we are in here, we want to see if the Earth is curved. We can have a big rope, or we can even walk from one point, just go straight over there, some amount, and if you were to, to go to just some 90 degrees on the, on the equator, and walk again and again, again, and then take another 90 degrees, if you were to make this path, even by mistake, because you don't know, if you don't know the size of this, you don't know where the equator is, right? So if just by mistake you were, were to do this, you would have done three 90 degree turns but you are back in the same place in which you started, right? So how can you do that in a, in a you can't possibly do that, right, in a, in a flat surface. Is that here? What you would do if you do three square turns, right? You start in here, you go, you do one, two, and you wouldn't reach, is it something in here? Right. And you, would, you wouldn't reach that point in the same time. You need four. We need to do four 90 degrees. Degrees. So what happens? This is a triangle, and the sum of the internal angles of any triangle, no matter what triangle you you draw, the sum of these angles should always be one eighth. If you draw this triangle on this flat surface, if you draw it on the on a planet, on some spherical symmetric, you might not get the number. That's one, you, that's one way you can tell. You can draw a triangle, measure the internal angles of the, the triangle, and make sure that they are one eight. If they are not, the space is curved. That's one way. Another way, which is it's just by grabbing a, a, a long rope, nailing one side in here, and then walking away with the other side, the other edge. And then once you completely strand the rope, you start walking, making a circle. Imagine you put a very high, very long rope. Eventually, you would make a circle like this. You can measure the ratio. You can measure the length of the rope. And you can also measure how many steps you took just to, to go around the, the, to the same place you started. And the circumference of the circle is not 2 pi r. So if you have a circle again, any circle, and have a radius, we expect the circumference to be 2 pi r. But only, again, if you draw it in this flat surface. If you try to do this, you will see that this is not the case. In this particular case, the circumference of a circle is less than 2 pi r. It doesn't have to be less. It could be more. That only depends how the space is called. You can imagine other ways in which this is small. So that's the way we measure whether the, the space is called. And the question is, is the space-time curve? How can we know that? How can we measure? In the same way we do these silly measurements, how can we measure if the space-time is curved? This is the example that Einstein thought of. He said, well, let's have a compact disc. So this is, a, this is a disc with a given radius. And of course, when you have your disc in your hand, you can measure its complex. Now, consider a little slab of the edge in here. Imagine just a little slab in there. And you make this thing rotate very fast. This slab in here is actually going to move in at some velocity with respect to us while looking at this object. Because it's moving, we're going to see it shorter in length, and we're going to see it also slower if it had someone speaking there who would say it speaking slow. So this is shorter by a factor of nano, which is the velocity of at the edge of the ring. So if this is shorter, and this is the way I can argue, if this is shorter, the total circumference has to be shorter. So his conclusion was then, because this is rotating, space-time somehow being twisted, and we get the same problem. The circumference of the circle is not 2 pi r. And so he concludes, space-time must be curved. And this is one of the, the main things that 
drew him to actually reach this conclusion. Yes, No, because remember the, the length contraction was in the direction of the movement. So if I'm moving like this, you see me shorter in this direction, but not in height, because my height is perpendicular to the direction of movement. And the radius is actually perpendicular to the direction of movement. So, in a nutshell, massive objects curve space-time. The more mass massive, the greater the curvature space-time is. The greater the curvature, the more intense the gravity. And objects move following the shortest path in curved space-time. So, they draw in here, I took this from the web, they draw in here uh, several orbits, if you will. Imagine you have an object at this position, and you have a particle in here. If this particle, if you were to have this particle in here, and you want this particle to reach this point, the only way, the shortest path from this point to this point will be through this one. There's no other path. Any other path will actually be longer. So nature is choosing this always to go to the shortest path. And we have three particles in here. U for unbounded, uh, C, for closed orbits and E for elliptical. So this is like a big particle that's coming close to there, to the to, to some sun that is deforming gravity. And so it comes close, it bends its trajectory and it goes away. We we'll never see it again. This is a particle that cannot escape the gravitational field. This particle goes in there, goes very close, twists past and then comes back in here very close. But it doesn't have the energy to go all the way up. It has to come back. And so it keeps on spinning around. It's a very elliptical or elliptical orbit. And the final one is a close part, very much the Earth, for example, around the sun, around the sun. Uh, the sun, you know, the, the, the project, the, the elliptical component of the Earth around the sun is very small, really. It's more like a very nice circle. It has some, some, some component, but it's actually small, so you can imagine this there spinning around the sun. And of course, the, the lower the energy, for whatever reason, you have this particle losing energy, what's going to happen? It's going to be closer and closer. Exactly. If you lose energy, this particle will come and will come spinning closer and closer. And what happens when it gets closer to the center? It spins fast. It spins fast. So it's like having this. And then you get caught up close, and it's going fast, fast, fast. This is one of the, in particular, if you think about the way that Mercury was going around the sun, uh, it was noticed that the way it was, in, in pre-Einstein theories, you can imagine the sun in there and an elliptical orbit. That's fine, the, Kepler, the laws of Kepler allow you to do that. But then at some point they noticed that the, the big axis in this it's actually moving. So they say, how is that possible? And Einstein, and his theory, explained that perfectly. Once you account for all the, the gravitational effects, and once you account for, for the general theory of gravitation, you can predict this very, very well. And the, the orbit of Mercury matches perfectly what is supposed to be according to the general theory of gravitation. The gravitation is used much more than in this case. We use gravitation for CPS measurements. All the satellites that are up in there, they have to compensate for general relativity, not only for special relativity, not only for the fact that they are moving at some velocity, but also for the fact that they are high in the sky. And that about the time happens at a different pace up there than it happens in here. All these sort of general relativity and special relativity compensations have to be taken into account to get you a nice measurement of the pace in which you are actually 